I want to draw your attention um, to the role of emotions and moral concepts in the outbreak of what the British and French still call the Great War. World War I was and is widely perceived not just as a great war, but also as an utterly modern war, and Chris Clark uh, has already alluded to that. Modern not only with regard to military technology, to auto automobiles, and the never-ending supply of human bodies and non-human fighting material. World War I also figures as a modern war because it was a highly politicized and nationalized event, mobilizing each and every citizen on the battlefield and at the home front. It was a war that was fought with and for human souls by means of an unforeseen surge of visual and verbal propaganda. My argument here is that in contrast to its alleged modernity, World War I was prepared and negotiated along the lines of rather traditional moral concepts, actually what um, President Teddy Roosevelt alluded to as the bygone days of a lost or forlorn uh, civilization. Concepts of honor and pride, practices, emotional practices of shaming and humiliation. Such concepts and practices were used in order to translate national politics into friends and foes, and they were instrumental in fostering citizen support. In the end, however, they failed to ensure what was promised, an honorable conduct during the war and an honorable peace. The moral order of international relations before the Great War was not part of what James Joel once called unspoken assumptions. Instead, those assumptions were quite outspoken. They were taught to future diplomats by their seniors or by university lecturers, and they were embraced by wider audiences. Among the professors, and politicians outlining the moral laws of politics, Heinrich von Treitschke deserves a special mention. In his lectures at Berlin University in the 1880s, he stressed the concept of the state as the dominant bearer of sovereign power. As such, the state possessed and displayed a highly developed sense of honor. Quote, any insult offered, even if only outwardly, to the honor of a state casts doubt upon the nature of the state. Therefore, if the flag is insulted, the state must claim reparation. Should this not be forthcoming, war must follow, however small the occasion may seem. For the state, and this is still Treitschke's quote, for the state has never any choice but to maintain the respect in which it is held among its fellows. End of quote. After 1914, British politicians and academics readily attributed a particularly German spirit to Treitschke, whom they criticized for having drafted a new German theory of the state. This theory, however, was neither new nor exclusively German. Maintaining or restoring national honor was of vital interest to any state that claimed a powerful position within the European system. As honor was closely linked to power, any insult was held to be questioning the state's ability and fortitude to defend itself and stand up for its own interests, principles, and moral laws. Ultimately, it, the insult, was perceived as an attack on state sovereignty. This was, by and large, how it was played out in 1914. The manifesto of the Austrian Emperor, issued on July 28, 1914, justified the war against Serbia as being, quote, in the defense of the honor of my monarchy. When the Russian ambassador in Vienna announced his country's military mobilization on July 29, he added that the honor of Russia as a major power had been slighted, urging the nation to take the necessary steps. This allegation was refuted by Kaiser Wilhelm II, who, in a telegram to the Tsar, assured him, quote, nobody is threatening the honor or power of Russia. Tsar Nicholas, however, was not convinced. 
his August 2 manifesto not only referred to Russia's duty to prote protect Serbia, but also mentioned, quote, we must safeguard the honor, dignity, and integrity of Russia and her position among the great powers. For his part, the German emperor explained on August 5 that he was, quote, forced to draw the sword in order to ward off an unjustified attack and fight for our national honor. A day later, he issued a proclamation to the German people in which he argued that the enemies of Germany did not want the nation to, quote, stand in resolute fidelity by our ally, which is battling for its reputation as a great power and with whose humiliation our power and honor too would be lost, end of quote. On the very same day, British Prime Minister Asquith addressed the Commons with the following, quote, we are fighting in the first place to fulfill a solemn international obligation which, if it had been entered into between private persons in the ordinary concerns of life, would have been regarded as an obligation not only of law but of honor, which no self-respecting man could possibly have repudiated. Those words were quickly translated into images. They were also translated into poems, again on all sides. I will spell, spare you the dull and endless quotations here and limit myself to a sonnet by 26-year-old Rupert Brooke. Honor has come back as a king to earth and paid his subjects with a royal wage. And nobleness walks in our ways again and we have come into our heritage. As if he did not quite trust this reappearance of honor, Foreign Secretary Sir Edward Grey continuously referred to our respect and good name and reputation between, before the world. Using honor as a synonym for prestige and reputation was nothing unusual. Max Weber had done that before in his theoretical writings, thus modernizing a concept that to him seemed somewhat alien in a world allegedly governed by the rational assessment of prosaic interest. Alien and highly emotional, since honor was generally described as a sentiment rooted in the heart and physiologically felt. Weber himself had experienced that feeling in his own body and soul as a man who proved extremely sensitive about his honor in his professional and personal life. Um, and he, so he knew what he was talking about when, in his wartime speeches, he repeatedly referred to honor as a given fact. Even those who criticized the decision to go to war in 1914 did not doubt that honor was a powerful and legitimate emotional and moral concept. Although members of the British Labour Party did indeed question the government's argument about honor compelling Britain to go to war, they did not dismiss honor as a valid motive and reason to take up arms. To quote Ramsey MacDonald, if the nation's honor is in danger, we would be with him, meaning the foreign secretary who had defended his decision to enter the war on exactly these grounds. David Lloyd George, the then chancellor of the Exchequer, stood by the decision and yet not without conceding, quote, that whenever a nation has been engaged in any war, she has always invoked the sacred name of honor. Many a crime has been committed in its name. There are some crimes being committed now, and he was talking on September 19, 1914. But, quote continues, all the time, all the same, national honor is a reality, and any nation that disregards it is doomed. Why is it, no, the why question, why is it then that European monarchs, statesmen and politicians all referred to honor in 1914 and what exactly did they mean? Asquith's quote from August 6 provides a clue. When he alluded to the 1839 treaty that bound Britain no less than France and Prussia, Germany and other European nations to safeguard Belgium's neutrality and independence, he explicitly compared it to private obligations in the ordinary concerns of life. He thus 
deliberately linked national honor to personal honor, drawing attention to the underlying culture of honor that had pervaded 19th century Europe, including Britain. Honor was a very strong moral and emotional concept in those days with many facets and social shades. Honor was at stake when journeymen got into fights about what they perceived as insults. Honor was part and parcel of a merchant's personal and professional life. Honor was protected by laws that allowed workers to be immediately fired when they dared to offend their employer or a member of his family. The most rigid and conspicuous concern about honor reigned among, among the upper middle classes and the nobility. Over time, these circles had developed a code of honor, a point d'honneur, that proved extremely sensitive to any transgression and demanded strong action in the occasions when the code got violated. Those transgressions and violations were meticulously recorded and codified, while during the 18th century no formal codification was required. The 19th century produced a plethora of honor texts that instructed their readers about the right course of action in particular circumstances. This reflected the spread of honor customs. Once reserved for the narrow circles of the aristocracy, they later increasingly attracted male members of the burgeoning middle classes. The students and the academics who had to adjust to and conform to a refined honor culture, both in theory and in practice. As conscripts, with the exception of Britain, most European countries had introduced conscription during the 19th century. As conscripts, they learned to observe military customs, among them a strong emphasis on honor, translated into the pride of belonging to an institution that claimed to stand at the top of the social pyramid and thus demanded honorable treatment by others and by its own members. Honor was thus part of what Max Weber used to call a specific conduct of life that rested on a distinctive traditional ethic reinforced by education. This ethic, quote, Weber made personal relations central to the conduct of life and impressed every individual with the obligations of a status honor that was jointly held and thus a unifying bond for the status group as a whole. End of quote. Born during the medieval period, the traditions of feudal knighthood lived on in the modern world. As Weber saw it, both in Great Britain and on the continent, the current ideal of manliness and conduct of life clearly demonstrated that those traditions, including a strong sense of chivalry, still served as a crucial center of orientation. They were a center of orientation, above all, for those political and diplomatic elites who were in charge of making decisions in July 1914. The military, who became more and more influential as the crisis evolved, thought of honor as their inviolable possession. Diplomats, most of whom belonged to the aristocratic classes, as well as politicians who eventually decided on war and peace, all valued honor. Not surprisingly then, the interaction within and between those groups in the summer of 1914 was intensely marked by the language of honor. It was not only the word honor itself that was used time and again, and I gave you some quotes in official, semi-official, and secret communication. Other concepts and practices that were part of the lexicon of honor were even more frequently employed. Humiliation, insult, shame, challenge, satisfaction, offense. What gave this lexicon its particular weight and compelling urge was gender. Let me explain this because it might not seem <coughs> self-evident. Notions of honor and shame as they occurred during the 19th and early 20th centuries were outspokenly gendered. While honor was supposed to be a genuinely masculine concept, shame bore a thoroughly feminine meaning in two regards. And I show you, um, a cut, well, it's, it's not a cartoon, it's a kind of um, a poster from 1918, France. Um, it, it might, you know, looking at it now, it might seem quite, you know, coming from a fashion mag magazine or something, but it was 
uh, deliberately meant as a sharp criticism of French women um, well, collaborating or joining um, uh, forces with American, maybe American soldiers. There's a lot of subtext here, but um, these women actually were considered as uh, practicing a shameful behavior. So shame bore a thoroughly feminine meaning in two regards. First, shamefulness and decency were considered as female virtues and character traits. Women had to pursue these virtues by all means and under all circumstances. Shame was a permanent feature of the feminine world, and women had to be conscious of it, blushing constantly, lowering their gaze, avoiding each and everything that might taint their immaculate behavior. A shamed woman was a fallen woman who had lost her honor by behaving indecently or allowing other, others to treat her indecently. Second, as far as men were concerned, shame went hand in hand with debasement, with the loss of straightforward masculinity. Being called a coward, for example, um, brought shame, humiliating them in the eyes of others. Lacking the courage to stand up for one's own concept, concerns and deeply felt commitments was synonymous with being unmanly and effeminate. It was synonymous with losing honor. Honor thus posed very different demands on men and on women. Furthermore, only men could actively defend and restore their honor and escape shame. This included stepping in for the passive woman. The vital element of the honor code forced men to act on behalf of a woman whose honor had been violated. This was with what chivalry was ultimately about. The strong and courageous man defending the weak and helpless woman. The myth of chivalry, although increasingly criticized by late 19th century feminists, lent powerful support to the honor code. This held true on both levels, on the individual and the national level. We can see it very clearly in the language of international relations as it was spoken during the summer of 1914. According to the German Foreign Office, Austria's prestige was waning because of her continuous lack of action and her, quote, timid and undecided behavior. The only course of action was to react strongly to the Serbian challenge, thereby humbling and chastising the small but provocative country. Only a deep humiliation could reduce Serbia to her proper status and in turn lift Austria's prestige and honor. Russia saw it differently using the same metaphors. Little Serbia had to be protected as a matter of honor for a great and powerful nation that was obliged to go to its smaller allies' rescue. In the same vein, British politicians supported the decision to stand up for Belgian independence based on national honor. <clears throat> well, it's not British, but Irish and American, but Believe me, uh, <laughs> trust me. <laughs> um, this was apparent in Asquith's speech when he, in strong moral terms, justified Britain's going to war as an act of protecting a small, unarmed country against the unlawful aggression of a powerful neighbor. This became even more pronounced when David Lloyd George addressed a large audience at Queen's Hall, London, on September 19, uh, 1914. For Britain, it was, quote, an honorable obligation to defend Belgium's liberty and integrity. If Great Britain had not come to Belgium's rescue, quote, our shame would have rung down the everlasting ages. End of quote. Lloyd George insisted that it was not just a matter of adhering to treaties, but also a moral duty to help a small, weak country which had been treated brutally by its mighty neighbor. In short, it was an act of chivalry, and the politician did not forget to mention the slaughtered women and children who had to be avenged. In France, that had also signed the 1839 treaty, it was not so much a matter of protecting Belgium, but rather of safeguarding its own territory and, as a veritable point d'honneur, of reclaiming Alsace-Lorraine. The 1870 failure to protect their territorial integrity had severely shamed the French nation, 
and the lost provinces had been mourned ever since. Gendered images were used in order to illustrate Elsa's Lorraine suffering under the German rule. The provinces were represented as young girls in traditional costumes, desperately waiting to be rescued and returned to the motherland. Occupation and annexation were thus regarded as a violation of their honor and as, as a threat to the honor of Mother France and her sons. In 1914, then, those sons, as soldats citoyens, eventually took up the arms to liberate the land from the masculine German presence. Even blunter sexual allusions were used in order to describe what happened to Belgium and northern France in August 1914. After Germany's invasion, the public in France and Britain was flooded with images of German soldiers brutally trampling women and infants underfoot. Obsessively, men who shaped public discourse as investigators of war crimes, as journalists and illustrators, told horrible tales about mutilated female bodies. In a myriad of widely distributed pamphlets, posters, postcards, and newspaper articles, Two pictures went in tandem, that of the rolling, gentle Belgium of France invaded and the innocent, virtuous Belgian or French woman violated. As much as the German administration tried to dismiss these images as crude propaganda, some German intellectuals, among them Max Weber, used them in order to criticize what they perceived as Belgium's rape and castration. Those were Weber's words. A similar perspective was applied by Professor Philipp Wittkopp, but with utterly different judgment. Um, when he addressed German teachers in 1914, he strongly recommended a song that described the fall of Liège, or Lüttich, in barely concealed sexual terms. Jungfer Lüttich, virginal Liège, who was courted by Germany, chose, initially chose another lover, France before eventually and lustfully falling for the German invader who took her by force. According to Wittkopf, the song served as an excellent example connecting current and traditional war lyrics and should be sung after a familiar tune in every classroom. Chris, would you like to sing it for us? I mean, you're <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you can do it. <laughs> This might have reminded teachers and students of Friedrich Schiller's famous Reiterlied. It had used similar images uh, more than 100 years ago, but placed them in the early modern milieu of Wallenstein's mercenaries. In fact, the language and evidently practice of rape, invasion, and conquest had had a long tradition in European warfare. And as much as the conquerors were painted as strong and reckless men, their victims, both male and female, were held to be weak and helpless creatures. Without the intervention of a chivalrous knight, neither virtuous ladies nor humble peasants were in a position to fend off an attack. The 19th century had substantially modified this pattern when it declared all men responsible, not just the knights, the aristocrats, <laughs> all men responsible for defending their fatherland and family. Now, every man had to act as a knight protecting those who, as women, children, and elderly people, could not fight for themselves. Along these lines, governments in 1914 issued propaganda posters portraying soldiers as knights in shining armor on horseback. By invoking the tradition of bravery and chivalry, they depicted their troops as the physical embodiment of honor, while degrading the enemy as the figure of the barbarian rapist. At the same time, official manifestos call upon men to defend home and hearth, meaning the life and honor of their families and the land there that they inhabited. Apparently, this ideology was well received. Both volunteers and conscripts often explained their soldierly, soldierly role as fighting and dying, quote, for the sake of the women and children, not just of their own women and children, but also of those of smaller neighbors. At the same time, those men who tried to stay out of the war were treated with disdain and contempt. 
In Britain, women, some women, handed out white feathers to those who, in the absence of general conscription, did not enlist voluntarily. Young men, not wearing a uniform, were considered as cowardly, shying away from their foremost duty. By shaming them in public, women reminded men of their true honor that lay in fighting for those who were worth fighting for and who could not fight for themselves. When men complained about those horrible women who sent them to war instead of begging them to stay at home, they did not seem to understand what was at stake. It was not so much the fear to stand there without a hero that compelled women to act as they, or at least some of them, did. Rather, it was the intimate connection between male and female honor that made women utterly dependent on men's courage and strength. If men could not be motivated to defend their wives, daughters, or sisters' honor, that honor was definitely in danger. We've asked before why politicians were so eager to evoke the honor code in preparing and justifying decisions in July 1914 and what honor actually meant. We've by now seen that honor had been a familiar orientation, a widely respected concept deeply embedded in European narratives and modes of conduct. We then saw how the gendered language of honor, a language not only of words but also of images, lent itself to a powerful notion of chivalry that could be and was extensively used to drum up support for the war effort. What I do not want to do though is to promote, to promote a functionalist interpretation here. My argument is that honor was not invoked because it was useful propaganda. Instead, honor provided a lexicon of words, gestures, and postures that was flexible enough to negotiate a peaceful solution to the conflict. It did not pave the direct role to war, as we might think. It could also offer an elegant way out. We saw earlier how honor was not just a private feeling, but was institutionally enshrined and collectively embodied. On this level, there were clear regulations regarding the grounds on which honor could be insulted and what had to be done in such cases. Written, spoken, and habitualized rules also confirmed how men of honor had to behave in consideration of another person's honor. At the same time, those rules were not rigid. They were not cast in stone. They could be bent and adjusted to the circumstances. They left plenty of room for self-definitions and individual interpretation. Honor held a strong subjective meaning, although it was bound by general laws and enforced by peer pressure. Ultimately, one could always refer to their personal sense of feeling of honor. Even if people disagreed on the severity of the alleged insult, it was one's own prerogative to call the offender out or not. This said, the honor code was a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it served as a means of calling attention and giving importance to one's own life and social standing. Every minute detail seemed to matter, a look, a gesture, a word. Honor culture put the individual in a position of utmost power and insecurity at the same time. Power because it was his decision what to interpret in what way. Insecurity, because it constantly felt vulnerable to any sign of negation or disrespect among his peers. This could have a disciplinary effect as everyone was cautious and sought to avoid the kind of behavior that might be considered as insulting. But it also allowed for personal conflicts and provocations to be taken to a disproportionate and life-threatening level of seriousness. On the other hand, the honor code offered exactly those means of mediation and control that conflicts need in order to be dealt with in a respectful and face-saving way. First, there was always the possibility of opponents stepping back and apologizing. Even if it were agreed upon that some insults could not be mediated, like adultery or a slap in the face, there were many others that could and would. The inbuilt processes were such that allowed the blood to cool 
instead of engaging in further blows and insults. Furthermore, they demanded the interference of third parties. Seconds had to be nominated to solve the conflict in a non-violent fashion by, for example, clearing misunderstandings or inviting and enabling apologies. Third and last, if these attempts failed, the duel itself was fought according to strict rules that guaranteed equality of chances and risks and set limits to the violence unleashed during the fight. Most duels actually ended without a drop of blood being spilled. And they ended in perfect harmony if we believe those duelists who reported on their feelings during and after the event. The fight had not just done justice to the moral order governing upper class men's behavior, it had also restored the balance between the two opponents. Each one had maintained his dignity, shown courage and determination, and acted in accordance with his principles. Plus, the dualists had accepted each other as equals, despite and beyond the initial conflict. The duel itself was regarded as an act of mutual respect, a respect, however, that was restricted to members of one's own class, gender, and increasingly race. What does that mean now with regard to the decision-making process of July 1914? With hindsight, Knowing how things ended, we can clearly see how all the talk about humiliation, insult, <laughs> challenge, weakness, satisfaction, about standing by one's allies and protecting the weaker members of the tribe, made a case for the ultimate consequence of going to war. There was a certain urgency at work, an escalation of words and claims that seemed to be leading directly to face-to-face -to -face combat, to the extended duel that Karl von Clausewitz had thought the war to be. Yet, in 1914, everyone, except perhaps for some German students who fondly imagined that going to war would be like standing on Menzur, in 1914, everyone knew that modern wars would be fought on a different scale. The American Civil War had already changed the picture, and so had the atrocities committed during the Russian, Turkish, and Balkan Wars. They had sent a strong signal that the old days of chivalry were over, and had been succeeded by a new era of industrial war, annihilation, and mass destruction. Against this realm of experience, the horizon of expectations was bleak, and it is under this new horizon that the language of honor could be regarded as utterly defensive. As argued before, it left ample room for maneuver in all directions. After the first insult had been perpetrated, the Sarajevo assassination, seconds could have come in. They might have brokered a deal between Serbia and Austria-Hungary to save the latter's face without putting Serbia in a position of defeat and deference. Even in later stages, and I'm fully um, on Christopher's line here, the, the conflict could have been negotiated along you know, honorable lines. Opponents were never compelled to fight as long as there were other opportunities to solve the conflict. Those opportunities, however, ultimately depended on the notion of equality and mutual respect that formed the background of 19th century European honor culture. Equality did not rule out competition, but it did rule out cheating, ruse, and above all, the quest for debasement and annihilation. Those were the new words and concepts that had entered the European political lexicon soft-footedly during the long 19th century. They were tied to a completely different logic, the logic of the zero-sum game. It, re it read as follows. One's own gain is somebody else's loss. If my power increases, it's at the detriment of my neighbor's power. In a radicalized version, I want my power to increase so that my neighbor pa neighbor's power decreases and ultimately fades away so that I can get rid of my competitors and monopolize power to cool. This was the 
kind of logic that had gained momentum during the age of aggressive nationalism, a nationalism that had introduced a language of monopolistic pride and debasement of other nations from its very beginning. This language gradually crept into the semantics of honor and undermined its substance of equality and moral and mutual respect. Public opinion, as it was voiced in the press, in private associations, pressure groups and social movements, proved indeed very susceptible to arguments about national honor being lost or regained. Public sentiments of national honor, as Lord Cromer, British, Britain's strongman in Egypt after 1883 put it, public sentiments of national honor were stung to the quick whenever colonial or inner European conflicts arose. And politicians were well advised not to run absolutely counter to the impulse of the national imagination. Instead of attempting, I'm still quoting Cromer here, instead of attempting an impossible task, they should seek to march ahead of the crowd and guide it. This was well said and well meant. At the same time, however, it misunderstood the peculiar strength and logic of public nationalism and jingoism as it had emerged in many European countries since the 1880s. And it understated the degree to which the old language of honor had already been captured and invaded by the new. Even the political establishment that upheld and negotiated the claims of honor in July 1914 had given in to the new grammar that had got rid of seconds, apologies, and rules limiting violence. This became even more obvious during the war that was fought ferociously, relentlessly, and in an expansionist mood that defied all former principles of restraint and consideration for other players. And it became crystal clear after the war when the winning side dictated the terms of peace. This was done without any regard to the face-saving, honor-bound mechanisms of assuring and ensuring equality and respect. Instead, humiliation and shaming processes set the stage, in sharp contrast to the way in which peace ne negotiations had been conducted in Vienna a century earlier. And maybe it would have been um, an interesting uh, deviation if those peace negotiations had, had indeed taken place in um, Christiania instead of Paris. Um, even German socialists who had no reason to mourn the demise of the old regime were taken aback by how those who had lost the war were treated by the winners. The traditional language of honor was finally silenced. The new language of shame and disgrace, spoken in all countries that felt betrayed by the peace treaties, not just Germany and Austria, but also Hungary and Italy, um, that, that new language sought revenge, not conciliation. It was no longer spoken between equals, but between superiors and inferiors, between those who reserved honor, or what they defined as such, exclusively for themselves, denying it to others. And it paved the way for the next war to come two decades after the first, the Great War, had finally ended. Thank you very much.